Waking up is a fairly essential part of everyday life. It's a pretty difficult thing to mess up for most regular people, but Ash Ketchum is a long way from normal. In Pokemon I Choose You, the first episode of the Indigo League series, Ash oversleeps after breaking his alarm clock during a particularly vivid dream. That one action set the Pokemon protagonist on a course that's played out over the last 20 plus years. So, if an idiot flaps his wings in Pallet Town, can it really have unforeseeable consequences at the Indigo Plateau more than a year down the line? The butterfly effect is inherently unpredictable, but in this video I'll be attempting to plot out how Ash Ketchum's journey through Kanto would have gone if he'd woken up on time all those years ago. In a world where the Pokemon theme song was performed by Evanescence, or Wan, or System of a Down, or Green Day, or any of the other 4 million artists who have songs where waking up is the focus of a verse or chorus, would Ash have been the champion of Kanto? Let's get to replotting. On the biggest morning of his young life, 10-year-old Ash Ketchum wakes up bright and early to head to Professor Oak's lab to receive his first ever Pokemon. Having spent his whole life dreaming of this moment, Ash arrives first with a clear picture in his mind of which Pokemon he wants to be his starter. This doesn't require any guesswork. We already know which of the starters Ash wanted to choose. I've thought about it a lot, and it took me a long time, but I finally decided to choose Squirtle. Already we veered wildly off course. Instead of arriving late and ending up with a disobedient Pikachu, Ash begins his journey with a Squirtle who's keen to get started on an adventure of its own. Of course, we know which trainer took that Squirtle in the alternate reality. Now that Gary Oak's first choice is off the table, he decides to choose Bulbasaur knowing that it has a type advantage against Ash's first Pokemon partner. After receiving a Pokedex and Pokeballs from Professor Oak, Ash sets out on the road to Viridian City. When he spots a Pidgey in the grass, he sends out Squirtle and after learning its moves from Dexter, instructs it to use Tackle. In this timeline, Ash has a competent starter who listens, and that means he's able to successfully battle and catch Pidgey. We're in episode 1, and Ash has already caught a Pokemon. That catch means the whole Spiro mess never plays out like it did in the alternate reality, which in turn means Ash never runs into Misty and steals her bike, so no early companion for our hero? That might be a stretch, let's say main character. Ash, Squirtle, and Pidgey make it to Viridian City safely, and without needing to stop at the Pokemon Center, they never cross paths with Team Rocket. This is definitely a good thing for Jesse, James, and Meowth. They seemed somewhat capable before coming across Ash and Pikachu, so maybe they can stay on that path and actually impress Giovanni in this reality. We've already lost Misty and Team Rocket as central characters, and the former's absence means Ash isn't catching Caterpie in Viridian Forest. Misty pointed out the bug type, so without her there, Ash can just walk right on by. Having caught a Pidgey just outside of Pallet Town, he also lets a Pidgeotto go without battling it. Instead, his first attempted catch in Viridian Forest is Weedle. Unfortunately, Samurai interrupts him and the poison bug gets away. The mysterious trainer challenges Ash, but without Metapod and a whole heap of luck, Ash is quickly defeated. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this does mean we're not getting any Metapod versus Metapod matchup. Squirtle and Pidgey are incredibly weak from battle, so Ash has to hurry onwards to Pewter to get them all healed up. On the outskirts of the city, Ash runs into Flint, who directs Ash to the nearest Pokemon Center. While his two Pokemon are being attended to, Ash spots a poster promoting the Pokemon League Regional Championships. Taking in all this new information about gyms and gym leaders, Ash decides to challenge the Pewter City gym leader, Brock. Even though he's got Squirtle on his side, Ash's general incompetence still leads to him losing the battle. Ash's starter doesn't even know a water type attack, so when Brock's Onyx constricts Squirtle, he's forced to forfeit the match. Flint decides to help Ash defeat Brock, but instead of supercharging Pikachu, he just helps train Squirtle. Once the starter learns Water Gun, Ash returns to the Pewter Gym to take on Brock once again. In this reality, Ash is actually on the cusp of victory without the use of sprinklers, but Brock's siblings stop him from calling for the finishing blow. Brock sends them away and finishes the battle with Squirtle's Water Gun taking down Onyx. In what can only be described as a miracle, Ash Ketchum has won a gym badge, fair and square. After watching the battle from the wings, Flint reveals himself to Brock, telling his son that he's ready to return home to care for his many, many children. Brock decides it's time to follow his dreams of becoming the world's greatest Pokemon breeder and joins Ash on his journey. They travel through Mount Moon to Cerulean City, coming across a series of rare Pokemon and encountering Team Rocket for the first time. Although, as Ash doesn't have his seemingly superior Pikachu, Jesse, James, and Meowth don't become obsessed so they're still just background characters. Brock does add a Zubat to his team, but Ash misses out so he's still just working with Squirtle and Pidgey. After getting the better of Team Rocket, they continue on the road to Cerulean City. Once they arrive, they head for the gym, where Ash finds the three gym leaders and learns that they don't have any interest in battling him. The three sisters running the gym just hand over a Cascade badge, and although Ash would rather battle, they don't have the Pokemon required for it. Ash has picked up a second badge without doing anything at all. Nice. 
Having missed out on a battling opportunity, Ash is keen on getting experience before his next gym battle. After taking down a Rattata, Squirtle evolves into War Turtle because in this timeline, Ash has acquired a starter that Oat actually trained to be easy to raise. This is a really positive start to his journey. We can skip ahead to Ash meeting his Bulbasaur for the first time because that's the next major moment we have to cover. This basically plays out the same. The only real difference is that Misty never interrupts Ash, so he's the one trying to catch Oddish when the Grass Starter shows up. There we go, Pokemon number 3. I really wish this wasn't the case, but sadly, Ash also ends up with Damien's Charmander. I've spoken about this before in another video, but obviously Brock would be a far better trainer for him. But yeah, I couldn't see anything that would change the original timeline on this one, so Ash has a Charmander too. Although Ash and Brock do have a brief holy encounter with the Squirtle Squad, they never come across Team Rocket and join forces with Meowth, so it remains brief and we can move on. There's no taunting from Misty on the road to Vermilion City, but Brock does point out that Ash will need six Pokemon to compete at the Pokemon League. Feeling determined, Ash heads for the nearby beach and ends up catching Krabby just like he did in the show. This time around, Krabby isn't transported away though, because that's only Pokemon number five for Ash. So that's where we're at as Ash makes it into Vermilion City. Waking up on time has caused the Pokemon protagonist team to change up ever so slightly. Three of his Pokemon are the exact same, but Pikachu has been replaced by Wartortle, Pidgeotto's been swapped out for Pidgey, and Squirtle and Butterfree have been skipped over entirely. Of course, Ash's battle with Lieutenant Surge was a face-off between Raichu and Pikachu in the original series, but now that's not an option. Instead, the Pallet Town native challenges the Vermilion Gym Leader with Wartortle. Naturally, it doesn't go so well with Surge's Raichu quickly overcoming Ash's directionless Wartortle. That's hardly the water type's fault, I think the blame lies solely on Ash here. As Pokemon often pick up personality traits from their trainers, Wartortles develops a bit of a stubborn streak and seems adamant that he can beat Raichu. Brock offers to help the turtle by teaching him to use the move Dig with the help of Onyx. That'll give Wartortle a super effective attack to use against Surge, which may just be the edge that he needs. Ash and Wartortle train with Brock and Onyx, eventually mastering the new move. Dig allows Wartortle to avoid Raichu's Thunderbolt while also giving him the opportunity to hit back hard. That's enough to get the battle over the line and earn Ash the Thunder Badge. Having pinned a third badge to the inside of his jacket and strengthened his bond with Wartortle, Ash heads for the SSN with Brock. As he never caught Caterpie, Ash chooses to battle the gentleman aboard the ship with his Pidgey. In the end, Raticate takes out the flying type so the gentleman never asks for a trade. That means there's no Butterfree to get back when the ship starts sinking so Ash and Brock get off in time. They never get trapped on board so they can travel onwards to Saffron City right away. The best change that I can report so far is that we don't have to experience the heartbreak of releasing Butterfree because there's no Butterfree to release. That episode is now called Hi Hi Butterfree and it possibly features Tim Messenger from Hot Fuzz, I'm not sure yet. Anyway, once he reaches Saffron City, virtually nothing changes. Everything plays out more or less the same with Wartortle taking the place of Pikachu. Sabrina triumphs in the first face-off with Abra evolving into Kadabra and then Ash and Brock travel to Lavender Town to find a ghost-type Pokemon. Haunter follows the duo back to Saffron, where Ash takes on Sabrina for a second time. Haunter makes Kadabra laugh, that causes Sabrina to laugh, the gym leader is forced to forfeit, and just like that, Ash can add the Marsh Badge to his jacket. The butterfly effect really didn't come into play at all there, so let's get to something that actually changes because of Ash waking up on time. While traveling down Route 7, our two voyagers take a break to wolf down some delicious, meat-filled, seaweed-covered donuts. Hmm. These donuts are great! Jelly filled are my favorite! Nothing beats a jelly filled donut! As they're enjoying this horrific Frankenstein of a snack, a manky stops by looking for some free food. Clearly, it doesn't understand exactly what it's asking for, but for some reason, probably because he's kind of awful, Ash throws a Pokeball at the fighting type while it's eating. This doesn't go particularly well, and manky ends up stealing Ash's hat. Now, around this point in the alternate timeline, Team Rocket show up and James kicks manky, which, not cool. That's what angers it enough to cause an evolution originally, but as there's no obsessive Team Rocket in our timeline, there's no evolution. Instead of adding a Primeape to his team at episode's end, Ash catches Mankey as a first stage Pokemon. That may not seem vitally important right now, but its significance will become apparent shortly. Anyway, with the addition of Mankey, Ash finally has a full team of six. Everyone say hello to Wartortle, Pidgey, Bulbasaur, Charmander, Krabby, and Mankey. Alright, Celadon City brings us another alteration. As Misty and Pikachu are elsewhere, Ash never ends up cramming both feet in his mouth in front of Erica. As he never insults her perfume, there's no issue with him coming to challenge the Celadon Gym. It's not that he isn't an inconsiderate person in this world that we're exploring, it's just that Erica doesn't realize it here. All of this means Ash is able to defeat Erica with Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Pidgey, with the latter evolving in the process. 
More important than the Rainbow Badge addition is the fact that the Celadon Gym doesn't burn down in this timeline. That's the second building that's been saved by Ash waking up on time. I didn't mention it when it happened, but avoiding Team Rocket and Viridian meant the Pokemon Center never exploded. So yeah, even if it's just for the savings on property damage, Ash waking up on time seems to be a good thing. Okay, Hypno's nap time is ironically not an episode that greatly changes Ash's path based on when he awakens, but we do need to check it out for a second. On the one hand, there's this. Bulbasaur! Bulbasaur! On top of that, I don't really have the words to describe it, let's just call it that, Brock ends up with a brand new Pokemon. Due to his frankly concerning obsession with Nurse Joy, Brock offers to take a trainerless Psyduck off her hands. This happens in both timelines, but back in the world where Ash overslept, Misty trips over and accidentally catches the water type. That's not possible here. As much as he doesn't want it, Brock's stuck with Psyduck. Luckily, that doesn't affect the next episode, and Brock still picks up a brand new Vulpix. Nothing really happens to Ash though, so we can move on. On the outskirts of Fuchsia City, they come across a Hitmonchan that Ash attempts to capture. The fighting type already has a trainer though. Anthony shows up, and all of this leads to Ash and Brock entering the P1 Grand Prix. Mankey and Geodude are their selected entrants, and although Ash advances through the quarterfinals, he is beaten in the semifinals by Machamp. In the alternate timeline, Primeape had the required physicality to overpower Machamp, but Mankey can't quite manage it. Thanks to the early loss, Anthony no longer offers to train Ash's Pokemon, so Mankey's staying in the party for now. Before making it to Fuchsia, there's one last stop in Gringy City. Ash and Brock head for the Pokemon Center as it's late, but when they arrive, a power cut sends them in the direction of the power plant instead. Originally, I thought the lack of Pikachu meant that Ash would end up catching Magnemite, but that's not the case. The Magnet Pokemon is only following Ash in the alternate timeline because it's attracted to the overcharged Pikachu. So, with Wartortle now at Ash's side, Magnemite never shows up in the first place. Ash still catches Muck at the end of the episode, but it goes straight to Professor Oak, so his party's unchanged for now. Alright, the Fuchsia Gym battle's up next, and surprisingly, this one barely changes either. The only major difference is that there's no interruption from Team Rocket. Pidgeotto and Charmander combine to pick up the win for Ash, and just like that, we're up to six gym badges. That was easy. Next up, we've got the episode, The Kangaskhan Kid. There's nothing vitally important plot-wise here, but we do get to see the world's worst father in action, so that's nice. This is a really weird episode. Early Pokemon was pretty bizarre. Episode 35 was never dubbed into English because Kaiser repeatedly threatens to shoot Ash, but we have to check it out anyway. This is the episode where Ash catches his herd of Tauros in the Safari Zone, but without Jesse and James tracking them, there's a slight change there too. Team Rocket challenges Ash, Brock, and Misty in the alternate timeline to a Pokemon catching contest. If the trio can catch more Pokemon than Team Rocket, then they'll stop following them. That's why Ash is so intent on catching as many Pokemon as possible. In our timeline, only two Tauros join Ash's team. The first one he catches deliberately, but the second one was just an accident that he happened to capture while attempting to add a Rhyhorn to his growing group. This means Krabby is heading for Professor Oak's lab because Tauros is joining the party in its stead. Having switched up the members of his party, Ash and Brock find themselves in a town that happens to be hosting a carnival. In the alternate timeline, Misty gets roped into doing a magic show with a man named Melvin. As this never occurs in our timeline, Charmander never earns a ton of experience from demolishing an army of Executor. That means no evolution into Charmeleon, which can only be a positive for Ash's journey going forward. The lack of Team Rocket next comes into play in Attack of the Prehistoric Pokemon. Their attempt to blow up the entire canyon leads to Ash discovering all of the fossil Pokemon. Then he's lifted off by Aerodactyl and his Charmeleon evolves into Charizard. Ash also finds an egg that ends up hatching into Togepi, but without Team Rocket in the area, none of that happens. Instead, we get a full 20 minute thriller about Ash, Brock, and Gary doing some excavation in search of fossils. Fun! Another month or so passes by without any skewing from the late rising timeline before Ash and Brock find themselves on Cinnabar Island. The only real difference in the lead up to the gym battle with Blaine is that without Misty present, it takes our leading duo much longer to solve Blaine's riddles. And when I say our leading duo, I mean Brock. Let's be honest, Ash isn't getting close to solving any riddles. Once the gym battle gets going, Tauros and Mankey both play their part before Wartortle evolves into Blastoise to take down Magmar and hand Ash another win. The Volcano Badge makes seven and Brock tells Ash that they've got to head to Viridian City for the final gym badge. The lack of Team Rocket, Misty, and Togepi changes things up in the final gym badge too. Instead of Jesse and James taking Giovanni's place in Viridian, the Team Rocket leader leaves his gym in the hands of some other random lackeys. Maybe it's Butch and Cassidy. It's probably just someone else random though. Ash comes out victorious with Mankey finally evolving into Primeape to take down Machamp. A nice bit of revenge for the fighting type. Ash pins the Earth Badge to his jacket and gets right on the road back home to Pallet Town. 
On the way back, they come across a traveling circus, but the only thing of importance that occurs is Ash's mom getting a Mr. Mime. Once they make it back to Pallet Town, they run into Gary at Professor Oak's lab. In the alternate timeline, Team Rocket interrupt a potential battle between the two, but they're not here this time around. That means we get an Ash vs. Gary battle for the first time ever. Although Gary has trained his Arcanine to use his speed to dodge water type attacks, he's caught off guard by an unexpected dig. That gives Ash the early lead, but Gary sends out his Venusaur next, who makes pretty quick work of the tired Blastoise. Ash chooses Charmander next, who fights his hardest, even evolving mid-battle, but it's not enough. Charmeleon attacks with everything he has, but Gary's Venusaur is too well trained. The fully evolved Grass Starter ultimately gets the better of Charmeleon and gives Gary the lead. Ash settles on Bulbasaur for his final Pokemon, and with all the damages taken from Blastoise and Charmeleon, Venusaur can't score a third consecutive KO. Bulbasaur gets the better of Gary's starter, leaving the rivals in a one-on-one. -on -one. Nidoking's up last, and after a back-and-forth contest, the two collide with tackles, knocking one another out to end the match in a tie. Ash is over the moon with the effort his Pokemon put forth, but Gary's visibly disappointed. After training a while longer in Pallet, Ash and Brock head for the Indigo Plateau. On their way, they come across a trainer who asks for a battle with Ash where the winner gets all of the loser's badges. Blastoise takes down Marowak to hand Ash the win, but the stranger reveals that all of his badges were stolen. Ash and Brock work together to help retrieve his badges from Team Rocket, but this all plays out the same and is ultimately sort of unimportant. Let's move on to the Indigo Plateau Conference. There aren't really any notable changes to Ash's first battle on the water field. He chooses the trio of Krabby, Blastoise, and Bulbasaur for his face-off with Mandy, but it goes the same as it did in the original timeline. Krabby sweeps through Mandy's whole team, evolving into Kingler in the process. Pretty decent little debut there. We don't get a great look in on the Rockfield battle, but it's safe to assume that this one still goes off without a hitch. Blastoise actually gets some use this time around, finishing things off against Nidorino. Again, we're arriving a little late to Ash's third round matchup against Pewter's Pete Pebbleman, but it plays out similarly once again. Kingler takes care of Cloyster before Blastoise makes short work of Arcanine on the slippery ice field. Another change in this timeline is Gary's battle against Melissa. Having failed to overcome Ash back in Pallet Town, Gary spends more time training than ever before. Melissa's Golem is no match for Venusaur, who sends Gary through to the last 16 with a solar beam. In Ash's final preliminary battle, he takes on Jeanette Fisher on the grass field. Although her Bellsprout proved very capable in the alternate timeline, it's no match for a cooperative Charmeleon who cremates the flower with a flamethrower. That earns Ash's place in the tournament finals along with his oldest rival. Ash and Brock do quickly meet with Richie, but without Pikachu or Team Rocket to influence things, it remains fairly brief. The two are drawn against one another in the last 16, but Team Rocket's absence also means Ash arrives to the stadium on time with all of his Pokemon healthy and ready to battle. They start things off with Ash's Blastoise taking on Richie's Butterfree. After calling for Sleep Powder, Richie surprises to see Blastoise dig underground to avoid the attack. The water type waits for an opportunity and then emerges to attack with Hydro Pump. The blast of water blows Butterfree out of the air to give Ash a very early advantage. Richie calls on Sparky the Pikachu next, and now he knows about Blastoise's secret weapon. Richie prevents Ash's starter from using Dig by sending Thunderbolts at the ground in whichever spot it tries to dig down. Blastoise eventually manages to exploit Richie's focus on preventing Dig by connecting with Hydro Pump, but Sparky's Thunderbolt eventually evens the matchup. Ash chooses Primeape next, and with Pikachu weakened from battling Blastoise, it only takes a single seismic toss to put the Pallet Town native back in control. Last up for Richie is Zippo the Charmander, who's quickly thrown backwards by Mega Kick, but determined to help his trainer win, it blows back the fighting type with Flamethrower. After landing several big hits each, Zippo finally picks up the win, taking Ash down to one. The battle's final face-off sees Richie's Charmander going up against Ash's Charmeleon. After the war waged against Primeape, Charmander can barely stand. Charmeleon charges it down with a Skull Bash, finishing off Zippo and Richie for good. This was where Ash's journey came to an end in the late rising timeline, but getting up early has seen him through to the quarterfinals. Ash's opponent in the final eight is Asunta, and they'll be facing off in a full 6 on 6 battle. We only know about three of her Pokemon for sure, and they are Rhydon, Venomoth, and Ivysaur, so it's tough to predict exactly how this one would pan out. Ash does have some issues with full battles at this point, because he really only trains a few Pokemon at once. Still, it's my video, and I'm not that impressed with the Sunta's few on show. She's also got either a Spearow or a Tentacool in her team, which doesn't say much for the remaining two. So what I'm saying is, Blastoise, Pidgeotto, Charmeleon, Bulbasaur, Primeape, and Kingler get Ash over the line and into the semi-finals, where he draws... Gary. Having trained specifically for this moment, Gary's fully prepared for everything Ash has to throw at him. Luck and weak opponents can only take you so far. 
The battle comes to a close with Blastoise attempting to dig down against Arcanine only for the fire type to fill the created cavern with fire. Blastoise crawls out of the ground and then faints which signals the end. It wasn't even close though, Gary finishes up the match with almost his whole team standing and then heads on to triumph in the final. At the end of the day, waking up early can change Ash's team and experiences slightly, but his unearned self-confidence will always cost him in the end. Even though he spent many nights dreaming of winning the Pokemon League, Ash never invested the time in training. Failing to beat Ash definitely could have pushed Gary to train harder and leave the Indigo Plateau as champion though. Maybe that would have spurred Ash on to do even better in Johto and his strong team could have grown even more there. This is all just guesswork though. I just wanted an excuse to see what might have happened in a world where Ash didn't sleep in on that first day. It does seem that waking up early would have led to a more successful journey for Ash, but who knows? In the words of that one guy from System of a Down, wake up, make up, you know, poignant stuff. Okay, that's all I've got. Bye.